This video contains solutions to sample problems from section 3.2 on problems involving trigonometric integrals. So we're going to cover a lot of the different cases, especially integrals involving sine and cosine, and then a little later integrals involving secant and tangent. Obviously, I can't do every possible case for you, but I'll show you a lot of different uh, techniques that come up. This is probably the simplest example here because we have our function sine and cosine, and we're relying on the fact that we know that the derivative of sine is cosine, and that the derivative of cosine is sine. And so because we have a single copy of cosine and everything else in our integral is in terms of a sine, we're gonna use a substitution u equals the sine of x. du equals cosine x dx, and so this is a simple substitution and gives us the integral of the integral from, of u to the fourth du, that's just one fifth u to the fifth plus c, which is one fifth sine to the fifth of x plus c. Doesn't really get much easier than that one. So for this one, we have a power of sine times a power of cosine. And so what we want to look for in problems like this are the exponents on those uh, two trig functions. And what we see here is that both of the numbers are odd, which means we actually have a choice here. We can decide to split off one copy of sine and then substitute u equals cosine, or we can split off one copy of cosine and substitute u equals sine. So we've got some options here. So probably the easier thing to do is go with the lower power. And so what I'm gonna do is split off one copy of sine and rewrite this as sine squared of x times cosine to the fifth of x times sine of x. And then I'm gonna use the identity that tells me that sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals one to rewrite that sine squared of x as one minus cosine squared of x. So now I get one minus cosine squared of x cosine to the fifth of x, and then times the sine of x dx. So now when I substitute u equals the cosine of x, notice that everything in my expression now is in terms of cosine, except for that one sine at the end. And I want to have that one sine at the end, because now when I do the substitution, that extra sine at the end is going to be what's going to make this substitution happen. Now I am missing a negative sign, but I can do that by putting in a factor of negative one, as long as I put a negative out front. So now I have minus the integral of 1 minus u squared times u to the fifth times du. If I distribute that negative and multiply this out, I end up with u to the seventh minus u to the fifth. That gives me 1 eighth u to the eighth minus 1 sixth u to the sixth plus c. And then I just substitute back in. I get 1 eighth cosine to the eighth of x minus 1 sixth cosine to the sixth of x plus c. Okay, so this example, we look at our powers of cosine and sine, and we see that only one of them is odd. So we don't have the kind of choice that we had in the previous problem. Now we really are forced to use the cosine and substitute u equals sine. So again, our process is to look at that odd power, separate one of the copies of that function, and move it over next to the dx, and then substitute u equals the other function. So in order to get du to equal cosine of x dx, I'm going to have to use u equals the sine of x. So if that's the substitution I'm going to use, that means everything else in my integral has to be in terms of sine of x. Sine to the fourth is already in terms of sine of x, so I need to rewrite cosine squared. Using that Pythagorean identity again, cosine squared of x is 1 minus sine squared of x times sine to the fourth times cosine of x dx, which is going to turn into my du here in a second. So when I do my substitution, I get 1 minus u squared u to the fourth du. Distribute my multiplication, I get u to the fourth minus u to the sixth. Take my antiderivative, I get one fifth u to the fifth minus one seventh u to the seventh plus c. Substitute back in u equals the sine of x, so that's going to be one fifth sine to the fifth of x minus one seventh sine to the seventh of x plus c, and that's our final answer. Okay, so what do we do when both of the powers are even? Here we use yet another trig identity, and in this case we use what we call the half angle formulas. There are two of them, one for sine and one for cosine. The half angle formula for cosine says cosine squared of x is one half times one plus cosine of two x. Sine squared of x is one half times one minus cosine of two x. So we've got those two formulas, 
And those are gonna be what we use to convert this integral into a, an easier to use integral. So because all of our powers are even, we're gonna break everything up in terms of pairs of these functions. So cosine squared, sine squared, and then another sine squared. And each of those is gonna get replaced using these half angle formulas. So we get one half times one plus cosine two x, one half times one minus cosine two x, one half times one minus cosine two x, and then dx. So now we're gonna multiply that out. That's gonna require some algebra, which I'm gonna uh, sort of glide over for you just to make this problem not take quite so long. But we've got three factors of one half, which means we've got a big factor of one eighth sitting out front. And when we multiply all that stuff out, what we end up with is one minus cosine two x plus, uh, sorry, minus cosine squared of two x plus cosine cubed of two x. And so that's really four separate integrals that we're going to have to do one at a time. So let's do those. So we've got one eighth times the integral of one dx. Not too much going on there. That's just going to be one eighth x. And then we've got one eighth times the integral of cosine of two x dx. Again, not too hard there. That's a simple u equals two x substitution. And so that's going to give us minus one sixteenth sine of two x. Then we've got minus one eighth times cosine squared of two x. And that's an example where we have a sine cosine integral where all of the powers are even. We've got cosine to the two. We don't have any sines, which you can think of as sine to the zero because there aren't any sine functions at all. So that means we're gonna to have to use the half angle formula again. Now here's the place where folks get sometimes tripped up. So if cosine of x is one half times one plus cosine two x, what's cosine squared of two x? Well, if the angle gets doubled, then if I apply my half angle formula to this angle, 2x, then I'm going to get cosine of 2 times 2x, which is cosine of 4x. So whatever the angle is in your parentheses, if it's just x, you double it and you get 2x. But if it's already 2x, then you double it and you get 4x. So when I rewrite this integral, I get minus 1 8 times the integral of 1 half times 1 plus cosine of 4x. So that's going to be minus 1 16th times the integral of 1 dx, and then minus 1 16th times the integral of cosine of 4x. When we take the antiderivative of 1, we get minus 1 16th x. Then we take the antiderivative of cosine of 4x, that's going to give us 1 4th sine of 4x. 1 4th times the 1 16th that we already have there is a 1 64th sine of 4x. So we've got our pieces of our answer are coming together here. And that's what we've got so far. And now that what's left is this guy. So now we have to integrate 1 8 times cosine cubed of 2x. Now here's an example where we have sines and cosines with an odd power of cosine. So we're gonna apply the method that we learned in the previous examples. We're gonna split off one copy of that cosine of 2x and we're gonna use that to do a substitution. In this case, u equals the sine of 2x because then du will be two sine 2x. We're gonna rewrite cosine squared of 2x as one minus sine squared of 2x. Cosine of 2x dx is gonna be part of my du, except I'm missing a factor of two, but I can put that in as long as I multiply by a one half out front. So this is going to be 1 16th times the integral of 1 minus u squared du. That's going to be 1 16th u minus 1 16th times 1 third u uh, cubed. And then finally, I'm going to get a big old plus c at the end. So what was 1 16th u? So 1 16th u was 1 16th times the sine of 2x. And then 1 16th times 1 third, that's 1 over 54. Uh, sorry, 1 over 48. And then u cubed is sine cubed of 2x plus c. Now we can simplify this a little bit. So we can take the 1 8th x and the 1 16th x and those uh, combine and give us positive 1 16th x. We can also take this positive one, uh, sorry, negative 1 16th sine of 2x and this positive 1 16th sine of 2x, those actually cancel out. 
And then what we have left is minus 1 64th sine of 4x, and then minus 1 48th sine cubed of 2x, plus c. And that is our final answer there down at the bottom. So a lot of steps here, so it's kind of nasty when you don't have any even powers at all. Oh, sorry, when you don't have odd, when you don't have any odd powers at all, it's pretty nasty. When all the powers are even and sines and cosines, these can be nasty. All right, so the next several examples are going to involve secant and tangent. And so at first glance, we might look at this and say, uh oh, both of those powers are even. This is going to be a nasty example like the one that we just got done doing. But actually, it won't be that bad because we're going to be relying on the derivatives of secant and tangent, which aren't quite the same as sine and cosine. So the derivative of tangent of x is secant squared of x, and the derivative of secant of x is secant times tangent of x. So which examples are easy and which are harder for secant and tangent uh, is not quite as easy as just looking at even versus odd. In this case, I have a secant squared of x, so all I need to do is switch the order here and move that secant squared next to my dx, and this can be my du if I let u equal the tangent of x. So if I let u equal tangent of x, du is secant squared of x, and this is an easy substitution. So this is just u to the fourth du. That's one fifth u to the fifth plus c. That's one fifth tangent to the fifth of x plus c, and we're done. All right, what about an example like this where all we have is secant? And so now we're going to need to use our Pythagorean identity, but the version of that Pythagorean identity that involves secant and tangent. So we already knew that sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x equals 1. The relationship between secant squared and tangent squared is that secant squared of x is equal to 1 plus tangent squared of x. So not quite the same thing. But what this lets us do is separate out a secant squared. So we've got secant squared of x times secant squared of x. This secant squared of x times dx, that's going to end up being my du. And the first secant squared of x, I'm going to rewrite that as 1 plus tangent squared of x. So if I substitute u equals the tangent of x, similar to what we just did in the previous example, then this is going to give us 1 plus u squared du. Antiderivative of 1 is u. Antiderivative of u squared is 1 third u cubed plus c. So this gives us tangent of x plus one third tangent cubed of x plus c. What about just tangent to the fourth? Well, you might think, oh, well, secant to the fourth wasn't so bad. What about tangent to the fourth? Unfortunately, it's not really symmetrical. It's, it, uh, it is going to work out a little bit differently. But we're going to have the sim a similar strategy where we're going to split off tangent squared and tangent squared. But unfortunately, tangent squared isn't really the derivative of anything useful, and so we're not going to be able to just do a simple substitution here. But we are going to rewrite tangent squared, one of these tangent squares, as secant squared minus 1, if I just subtract 1 from both sides of that identity. And now if we break this up into two separate integrals, we've got secant squared times tangent squared, which I'm going to rewrite in this order, tangent squared times secant squared, minus just the integral of tangent squared. Now this one, this first integral, I'm going to be able to do a u equals tangent of x substitution. The second integral, I'm going to use my identity again to rewrite tangent squared as secant squared of x minus 1. And I can integrate secant squared because that's just going to give me tangent of x. I can integrate 1 because the antiderivative of 1 is x. And so that's just going to give me plus x because I've got two negatives there, minus and minus. And then I've got my plus c at the end. So what about this first integral? Well, if du is tangent of x, or if u is tangent of x, then du is secant squared of x. So this is just the integral of u squared du. That's going to be one third u cubed. And so that's going to be one third tangent cubed plus all that other stuff. So that's my answer for this one.
All right, what about this last one here? So this is one of the examples of a secant and tangent integral that is the, probably the most challenging of these uh, examples. Uh, so it turns out that when you have this type of combination of evens and odds, this is uh, about as bad as it gets. So what we're gonna need to do is perhaps surprisingly, we're gonna need to use integration by parts here. And it's going to need to be integration by parts in kind of a tricky way. So I'm gonna call this integral i. And so we're gonna rewrite this integral first of all, split off one of the copies of tangent. So we've got tangent, and then we've got secant of x times tangent of x dx. And hopefully you recognize that secant of x times tangent of x, that's the derivative of secant. So if we use integration by parts here, we're gonna let u equal the tangent of x. We're gonna let dv equal secant of x tan of x dx. So that du is the derivative of tan ish, which is secant squared. And v is the antiderivative of secant x times tangent x, which is just secant of x. So when I use integration by parts, I end up with uv, so that's secant x tangent of x, minus the integral of v du, so that's going to be secant times secant squared, which I'm just going to go ahead and leave factored like that because we're going to split them apart in a second anyway. So secant of x times secant squared of x. And we remember that we can rewrite that secant squared of x as tangent of x squared plus one. So we've got secant x tangent of x minus secant of x times one plus tan squared of x. And if we break that up into two separate integrals, we get secant x tan x minus the integral of just secant x all by itself. We'll talk about that in a second. Minus the integral of secant x times tan squared of x. And you might recognize this integral is i, the original integral again. So if that's on the left-hand side of this equation, because that's what we started with, we can add that to both sides and get 2i equals secant x tangent x. Now, what's the antiderivative of just secant all by itself? Well, you might have learned this in calculus one, but that one's actually a little bit uh, of a nasty formula as well. But the antiderivative of just secant of x is natural log of the absolute value of secant x plus tangent x, and then plus c. So now the only thing left to do is to divide both sides by two. So we get that our, our integral that we're working about is one half secant x tan x plus one half, sorry, minus one half natural log of secant x plus tan x plus c. And that is our answer there. So integration by parts pops back up. We haven't talked about that much in this section, but we needed it for this example. And uh, hopefully this makes some sense for you. So in this video, we've seen lots of different strategies for integrals involving sines and cosines and integrals involving secants and tangents. So I hope this was helpful.